Hello everyone and welcome once again to our lecture series in uh, History 11 here. Uh, today we're going to kind of continue with the story from the, the last lecture, the first half of kind of this lecture on the Antebellum North, the North as it exists before the Civil War. And in our last, last lecture, what we were really looking at is kind of these big forces that are starting to transform the North. Uh, first, industrialization. The fact that the factories now exist, uh, the, the need for cheap labor to work in those factories is really starting to make the North look and act a lot different. Again, there's kind of a permanent poverty class starting to emerge in the North. Um, there's also a lot of wealth being created in the North. There's this market economy that's helping spur growth westward as more resources are needed to kind of feed this industrial machine that's starting to emerge. So there's a lot happening in the North. And of course, one of the other big things we looked at was the uh, beginnings of a massive wave of immigration, especially from two parts of, of Europe, Ireland and Germany. And as these new groups of people come flooding into the countries, it brings a lot of uh, change with it. New people that have uh, different customs, different ways of doing things, different religious beliefs in some cases. It really does kind of uh, change the complexity of things in this country. But as again, as I stressed many times last time, this is a story that's only happening in the north, right? I showed you some of those charts. I showed you some of the population densities. It's the north where most of these immigrants are going. It's the north that's seeing the growth of these really densely packed cities. Almost every big city in the country is located in the north, right? So the, these factors we talked about last time are, are having incredible consequences on the country and really starting to make one part of the country look very different from the other part of the country, right? The north and the south no longer kind of do things the same and kind of see the world the same way. A lot of things have changed besides just the use of slave labor, right? The south still uses slave labor. The north's moved away from it. But the south is still largely agricultural, uh, largely small individual farms. Now, there's still a lot of that in the north, but it's being replaced slowly but surely by industrialization and larger scale farming as well. So there's a lot going on here in the north. And what today's lecture about is about is kind of the response to all of this change, what northerners kind of start doing to kind of kind of fix some of the problems that are endemic in these things like like it is kind of a huge poverty class that's emerging. What do you do about all these new groups of people that don't speak English or, or don't, don't seem to be acting the right way or acting like Americans, right? And again, kind of pointed out that groups like the Know Nothing, the American Party, right? They start popping up here in the 1840s and 50s in response because they're afraid of the political power that these immigrants might have. So there's a lot going on here in the North that's really making it look and act uh, different than it had just a few decades earlier. And we're going to kind of continue that uh, theme today. And we're going to look at uh, two big uh, ideas that kind of come out of this, right? Uh, the first is, is the idea of reform. That is something that's very much on the on the minds of a lot of Northerners. Kind of mentioned this in one of our earlier uh, lectures as well. That when uh, the Whig Party finally wins their presidency uh, for the first time under William Henry Harrison, uh, one of the ways he was able to to beat out uh, the Democratic opponent. Uh, Martin Van Buren was by appealing to a lot of Northerners that kind of were tired of corruption in politics, that wanted the, the country to run better, right? Well, that was in part a response to a lot of these changes that we've been talking about here, right? Right? These new factors that are starting to pop up in, in Northern life here. So uh, some of the other things that are kind of going along with that, spurring some of these reform movements are things like temperance and of course, abolition, right? They're, 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 concerns that a lot of Northerners are starting to have here during this period. There are some of these two of the biggest reform movements that, that emerge in the 1840s and 1850s in this country. What is surprising, however, is how one movement kind of brings on another and brings on another, right? And really the one that starts a lot of this is the temperance movement. Now kind of remember uh, temperance is formed from the uh, root word temper. And temper has a lot of meanings, right? Of, of course it means, you know, somebody that gets angry or, or it can, can blow up at other people, right? But temper also means to kind of uh, remove impurities. And in this case, that's really what Northerners are talking about. Uh, remember, we kind of showed you some of those cartoons where they, uh, Northerners, uh, white Northerners, American, Native Americans, uh, Native born Americans would say things like, well, these people coming in, uh, they're, they're corrupting our culture. They're bringing bad practices like they drink too much, like Germans drink too much beer, Irish drink too much whiskey. 
Well, one of the ways to make these new people Americanize is to tell them to quit drinking so much. That's what temperance is all about here in the 1840s and 50s, right? Uh, get in and make these new groups that are coming into the country look and act more like the rest of the country, right? And of course, as the, as the temperance movement, as it's called, starts to spread in the country, it's going to bring about a reform after reform after reform. And I'll kind of go through those kind of quickly to kind of just show you how, how one thing leads to another here in the North. And then it'll eventually culminate in one of the biggest, most powerful movements. And of course, that is the abolition movement. But what's surprising is the abolition movement takes decades to become a big, massive movement in the North, whereas temperance starts off pretty big and gets bigger by the 1840s, it's actually having a big impact on the country. Abolition, a much longer, slower story. And we'll kind of explore that and kind of kind of see what's going on there. And again, kind of one of the other things that comes out of this is this need for reform, this need to kind of change things. Socially, the North is going to start doing things that the South isn't. And that, again, is going to lead to a lot of change that makes these regions kind of see each other as different places. So we'll kind of explore all of this together uh, today in this in this lecture. Okay, now uh, one of the things we're going to kind of take a look at, of course, is is what spurs a lot of this uh, reform, this idea of fixing the country, if you will, and it emerges here in the early 19th century in a thing called the Second Great Awakening. Now, of course, if you're going to call something the Second Great Awakening, that kind of implies that there was a First Great Awakening. And, of course, we talked about that in an earlier lecture. Uh, back in the uh, 1720s and 30s, there was a thing called the First Great Awakening. It was kind of a religious revival in, in the uh, American colonies. And again, it kind of showed how the American colonies were incorporated into this bigger thing called the uh, uh, English or British Empire at the time. And uh, the, this uh, First Great Awakening was really kind of a, a challenge to establish religions. It was this idea that individuals had a lot of power uh, over themselves, had a lot of responsibility uh, on their own to kind of uh, be good Christians, to kind of do the things that were expected of Christians, right? Uh, you didn't have to go to a, a big organized church to be a good Christian. You just had to read your Bible, right? That was, that was kind of the inspirational message that was coming out of the First Great Awakening. And a lot of uh, American colonists, responded to it and actually swept through the uh, British Empire uh, in the 1730s and 40s. Well, religion doesn't die off after the first great awakening, right? It is very much incorporated into, into the lives of many American colonists. So the second great awakening is a little different than the first great awakening because the first great awakening kind of made religion relevant to people's lives again after a few decades of kind of uh, just kind of going through the motions more or less. But here in the in the 1820s, uh, the Second Great Awakening kind of reminds people why they're going to church, what that what's expected of them being good Christians. So in that way, it's very much a kind of a, a successor to the First Great Awakening. So it's not really about getting people to go to church or pay attention to religion again. It's about making them uh, be the best they can be uh, in their religion, and it's kind of the kind of the way to think about it. So here in the in the early 1800s, this uh, again kind of this individualistic movement starts. Uh, the, the you the individual have to take responsibility. You the individual have to go and make the world a better place. Because after all, the, uh, a lot of Americans here in the early 1800s are starting to have this idea that the United States is a special nation, that it has a special place in the world, that we're able to do things that other countries just weren't able to do. Right? The the, the French Revolution kind of failed in a, in a lot of ways. Right? Ours didn't. Uh, our our Declaration of Independence was inspiring countries throughout the world. Nobody else was, right? So in a lot of ways, Americans kind of started to see themselves as kind of a, a chosen people, a, you know, kind of God's instrument, if you will, especially a lot of religious uh, Americans. And here during this, uh, this religious uh, reawakening in, in the 1800s, the Second Great Awakening, a lot of Americans want to make sure that this nation uh, lives up to its destiny, right? Uh, they said that it's obvious that we're supposed to kind of spread our ideals to influence the world, to make the world a better place. And you kind of have to in, in their religious thinking, right? Because if you allow corruption to exist out there in the world, if you're not the best Christian you can be, if you're not doing the best things for your community, then your community is not as good as it can be. Uh, it means that uh, corruption and evil can exist in your community, and eventually it could corrupt you. It, it could ruin you, right? So you have to get rid of these impurities. Again, going back to the idea of tempering things, right? Uh, 
So here in the, in the early 1800s, there's this incredible message over and over again of people needing to kind of fix things. Uh, that, that if for you to be the best Christian you can be, you have to make other people good Christians. Otherwise, they'll take you off the path. They'll make you not uh, you know, do the things you need to do. And in some ways, that's very much a response to what we were talking about in our last lecture. The fact that there are new people coming into the country that aren't doing the things that everybody expects people to do. And the fact that you do see kind of problems all about you. These industrial towns as they're popping up, like in this map of upstate New York, right near the Great Lakes region. Places like Buffalo, places like Rochester, along the Erie Canal area. Uh, they're, they're springing up, taking in all these raw resources that are flowing on the Erie Canal and starting to manufacture goods out of them, right? And a lot of they're attracting people from the farming areas in upstate New York to come and work in those factories. Immigrants are coming in. So little towns like Rochester that had been a tiny village just 50 or 60 years earlier are now bustling cities of thousands of people with lots of poor people walking the street. And of course, with the problems that come along with urbanization, a lot of people in crowded conditions, uh, there's gonna be more crime, there's gonna be more uh, social problems, things like prostitution, uh, drunkenness, right, in the streets. Those problems start popping up. And then when you add to it these new groups of people like the Irish or the Germans coming in, establishing their own little enclaves, their own little ethnic neighborhoods, uh, made people feel like they, that, that they were sometimes like outsiders in their own hometowns, right? And a lot of native-born Americans start saying, well, that's wrong. This needs to stop. This needs to change. So it kind of fits in well with this religious message that they're getting of that they need to be good Christians. They need to make sure they have good Christian communities. Well, now they see problems in those communities, and if they don't fix them, their communities won't be the places they need to be. The country can't fulfill its destiny, can't be the great nation that God wants us to be. So here in the 1800s, in the 1820s and 30s, when this Second Great Awakening gets going, uh, you're being told by ministers in, in, in churches, right, uh, to come in and be a part of all of this. Uh, that's what all these little dots are here on this map on the screen. Uh, there are different religious groups that are starting to pop up. During this time, you have new ministers coming along with their own interpretations of what, what Protestantism is, what their version of Christianity is. It's here in this period that you see uh, Joseph Smith come along and start uh, creating what will eventually be called the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, or as we know the more popular is the Mormon Church, will be born here during this period. The Millerites, the Fourierists, right? Uh, the Baptists really become a big, a big deal here during this period. So you kind of see uh, all, over and over again, people come through these towns, uh, these ministers from these different Protestant faiths telling you, you've got to get out and fix your community. You need to make it a good place. You need to fix these problems in your society. Otherwise, corruption will tear down our society and we won't be this great nation we're supposed to be. That's the message you're getting hit with over and over and over again. Uh, maybe uh, this picture kind of, kind of uh, brings that home, right? These ministers that are coming around, sort of like in the First Great Awakening, they're great public speakers. Uh, they use emotion, fiery speech to try and sway their audiences. And this artist is trying to capture this, this moment here, right? They're up on a stage. They're speaking to these huge crowds. The people are listening to them. They're getting, they're emotionally responding. Some people are passing out in the crowd, right? They're inspired by these speakers uh, to go out and do these things, to make these things happen. And these revivals are happening over and over again. No sooner would a minister like this one depicted in this picture come through your town than a couple weeks later, another minister had come through. But over and over, they're kind of hitting you with the same message, maybe maybe conveyed in different slight mannerisms, right? But this, the same overwhelming uh, message is being given to you over and over again. And one, uh, one of these ministers, one of these guys going around kind of giving this, uh, this kind of religious message in upstate New York is this guy, Charles Grandison Finney. He is one of these ministers going around, and, and he maybe succinctly uh, sums up best what this message is that's coming out of a lot of these religious revivals here in the 1820s. And he says, look, I have a retainer from the Lord Jesus Christ to plead his cause. He's saying, I've been sent by God. And if, you're, if, if, if I've been sent by God, that means you need to listen, right? You have to pay attention to what I'm saying. And his message is very simple. Every person is a moral free agent. And kind of stop and think what he, what he means by that, right? 
a free agent is somebody that can kind of play with in sports terms, right, can go play with whatever team they want to play with. They can they can kind of sign with whoever they want to. And Finney's message here is, look, uh, you have a choice. You can be a good person or a bad person. You need to be a good person because if you're a bad person, then you're going to tear down other people. You're going to be that corrupting influence that keeps us from being who and what we need to be. So he says, look, everybody has to make this choice and we want everybody to make the right choice. And if they're not, you need to help make them the, the, get to the right choice, right? It is on all of us to make these changes, to make this a good country. So that is really the core message it's, you're being hit with over and over again. You'll kind of see this, this moral free agency pop up again and again, all the way into the uh, 100 years later in the 1920s. They're still using that same basic message over and over again, that people are moral free agents. You have the right, you have free will to do bad things, but we don't want you to do that. We want you to make the good choices, right? Because it's we're all in this together, so to speak. We all have to make the right choice. Otherwise, we tear our societies apart. So over and over again, you're being kind of hit by these messages. And of course, that spurs this idea of reform, that you need to make the country a better place. And because it's coming from a kind of a religious viewpoint, right, it, it kind of uh, gets... Uh, seen in kind of a, in more moral terms, right? The morality is kind of what's behind this. So they're not talking about, uh, uh, you know, reducing corruption in, 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 uh, in, in politics, although that would be a part of it, right? What they're really talking about in these reform movements of the, of the 1820s and 30s is just making the country better morally. Make good choices. Be a good person. That is really what they're, what they're talking about here, right? So during this period, you kind of see people inspired by these ministers saying, let's get out there and do things. And what you're going to notice is there's one group of people that's really the backbone of all these, these uh, reform movements. And that is, for the most part, uh, middle class women. And you kind of have to ask yourself, why is it going to be middle class women that are mostly the ones doing the hard work here, organizing these meetings, going out and organizing events, taking on these big corrupting influences in their communities? Well, don't get me wrong. There are going to be upper class women that are involved in this. There are going to be people from the lower classes as well that are invested in these movements, right? But for the most part, they are going to be dominated by the middle class. And there's kind of a reason for that. Uh, first of all, it's going to be women because they've been kind of given this uh, idea of kind of being the moral uh, uh, backbone of the family, right, uh, of households. Uh, that in the, in the end, women kind of run the private sphere in, in the United States. That kind of goes back to that Republican motherhood idea that came out at the end of the uh, – a revolutionary period, right, in the 1780s and 1790s, this idea that women have to raise good kids so they'll be good citizens, women have to make good choices to make sure the country makes good choices, right, to raise men that are going to be good leaders. Uh, so, so women have a vested interest in a well-functioning moral society is kind of the idea. Middle class women become kind of the leaders of these movements because simply put, they have the time. Right. Uh, their husbands are good enough uh, professionals that they make enough money working for a lot of these new businesses that are popping up, being a part of this uh, market economy. Right. Their husbands make enough money that they don't have to worry about going to work. But because they don't have enough money to escape uh, urban life completely, because they don't have enough money to actually just kind of divest themselves completely from society, uh, they see the problems that are around them. Right. A lot of the middle class live in these towns like New York, that are becoming these big giant cities. And they're seeing the city, uh, they're seeing drunks on their city. They're seeing prostitutes on their city streets. They're seeing slavery, being, you know, slaves still being working in fields in, in some places, still being used as household servants in some places in the North until the 1850s. So they kind of see these problems that need to be addressed. And middle-class women, because they have the time, they have the energy, they have the agency, uh, they're very much going to be a part of this. They're not going to be the only ones, but they're very much the backbone of this movement, right? So uh, which of these uh, reform movements do you think will be kind of the, the biggest and the, and, and, the, and the most explosive at the beginning? Would it be anti-prostitution? Would it be temperance, anti-drinking? Would it be anti-immigration? Or would it be abolitionism, right, the removing of slavery? Now, honestly, they're all going to exist in some way or form. Uh, but when you get down to it, anti-immigration really isn't going to catch on with a lot of Northerners, right? Because uh, either they're not going to be touched by immigration too much, and it's not something they're going to see in their cities, especially in smaller cities in the Midwestern parts of the country. 
or they need the immigrants, right? They're, they need those immigrants for their businesses. They need those immigrants uh, to, to provide services, their household, uh, domestic work, that kind of stuff. So the anti-immigration isn't as big. Uh, the biggest one out of all of these might be kind of the least surprising, honestly. It's anti-drinking. Temperance movement is the one that really launches a lot of this because it's ubiquitous. And by that, I mean you can find drunken people everywhere, right? You can be in a big city. You can be a small town. You know who – you see drunk people on your streets. You see a lot of taverns, a lot of saloons, a lot of bars, right? Back here in this period in the early 19th century, on average, Americans drink about seven gallons of alcohol a year. That's about twice what uh, contemporary Americans drink, right? Today, it's about 3.2 gallons a year on average, which means a lot of people drink a lot less than that. Well, in the 1820s and 30s, it was pretty average to drink every single day. And there's some reasons behind that, right? Uh, alcohol's safer because it's been distilled, a lot of impurities, a lot of dangerous bacteria are gotten out of it, right? Water, milk, other things that we take for granted as being safe actually weren't safe in the 19th century. So what was? Alcohol. And that's what a lot of people spent their time drinking during the day, which of course meant that you build up a lot of tolerance to it. You have to drink a lot more. You get used to drinking more. And pretty soon you have people that are basically addicted to alcohol, right? Alcoholics. It's not common, but it happens enough that it becomes pretty omnipresent. You can see it in almost every American city. So here in the 1820s and 30s, it is the anti-drinking movement, the temperance movement that really launches a lot of this. But the one I'm going to kind of uh, maybe start with is a little bit different, right? Um, because uh, the one I want to start with here is the one that kind of shows you how effective these group reform groups can be inspired by their kind of religious messages and also how kind of short-sighted they can be sometimes, right? So we'll look at the anti-prostitution movement that kind of uh, pops up coterminously at the same time as the temperance movement, right? So the prostitution was a big issue in uh, American colonial life, but it was also still an issue in the United States now that it's an independent country and a functioning society on its own right. And of course, as cities are growing, as more and more Americans just exist, right? Uh, prostitution, of course, is growing per capita. As there's more people, there's going to be more prostitutes. It means it's more ubiquitous. You can see it in more and more cities, in more and more towns. So, of course, this is going to be one of the, the things that these reform movements are going to look at. They're going to see prostitution as dangerous. As, as poor working class men or even middle class men go and go to houses of prostitution, pay prostitutes for sex, they're taking away money that their families desperately need. They're breaking apart their family bonds, right? Men aren't doing their job of being good fathers, good leaders for their households. So a lot of these reformers decide we need to shut down the brothels, uh, the prostitution uh, enterprises in our cities. We need to get them out of there. And by 1837 in New York City, there's 15,000 members throughout the state of New York, actually, uh, that are members of this reform society. Get rid of prostitution in our cities and our towns. Well, they start picketing. They start standing out in front of these brothels, challenging the men that are walking up to them, right? Because everybody knows where these places are. Everybody knows who the prostitutes are. So these reform uh, reformers start going and challenging the people going to the prostitutes, saying, hey, I know who you are. They start printing names in the newspaper saying, hey, I saw so-and-so go into a brothel yesterday. I know they went in to hire a prostitute for sex. He's married, right? So they do public public shaming. Uh, the, the the ministers in their in their towns in the city of New York go around telling people, "Hey, if I find out you're you're going to a prostitute, I'm kicking you out of the church. You're not going to be welcome here anymore because you're not being a good person, right? You're not upholding your end of the of, of the of the uh, of the moral free agency that we're talking about." So amazingly enough, uh, these tactics are pretty effective. They get the prostitute rings to kind of shut down in their locations. Uh, the problem is. Uh, they just move over to another town or to another part of the city. So these moral reformers feel like, hey, we succeeded. We got the prostitution out of our neighborhood. But they didn't actually get rid of the prostitution, right? And they just moved it to another area because they didn't understand why this was happening. 
Why are so many women becoming prostitutes? I mean, it's, it's estimated that in London, England in the 1600s and early 1700s, about one in 10 women was a prostitute in the city of London. Why are so many women turning to prostitution? Well, because it was their only source of income, right? Think about it. If you're a young woman in New York City in 1830, you just moved from your family's farm. They can't feed you and support you anymore, right? The, the parent, your parents are dead. Your older siblings have taken over the farm. Uh, you're on your own now. So you go to this in New York City. You hope to get a job in one of these factories. You do, but you're paid really low wages. You can't support yourself, right? Uh, say you uh, get married to somebody, but you still have to work to help support the family. You have kids, your husband runs away or maybe dies in an industrial accident or just dies from disease. Uh, now you're on your own, but you're only making 10% of what a guy makes. You, you can't support yourself. What's the one way you can support yourself? One way you have some control over your financial situation? Uh, prostitution. So these reformers don't understand these underlying causes. They don't really understand kind of the driving force behind all of this. What they're looking at is kind of the surface issues. We don't like prostitutes in our towns because they cause uh, uh, social problems for us, so we'll get rid of them. But they don't understand that the social problems that under, underneath their society are what are making this uh, an issue in the first place. So this is a long way of saying, look, these reformers are powerful, uh, they're effective, but they don't always have the best solutions, right? They're not always going to have a, a very uh, long-term solution to their problems. It kind of explains why they're good at some things and bad at others, right? Why things like the abolition movement are going to take so long to really get going. Uh, why certain other reforms, really like political reforms, never really going to happen for maybe 50, 60 years in this country. Because they just can't really uh, always uh, understand the full force of, of everything at play in their society, right? So now let's turn ourselves to, to the main uh, cause here that a lot of Northerners throw themselves into in the 1820s, 30s, and into the 1840s, right? Well, as I mentioned earlier, again, Americans are drinking a lot by the 1820s. Uh, bars, saloons, taverns, call them whatever you want. Uh, they're the center of a lot of American communities. Uh, during the American Revolution, it is taverns where uh, the Sons of Liberty in New York organized their events to oppose British uh, rule. It's where a lot of Sam Adams friends met in Boston is at taverns, right? Before they had their big public meetings, they'd hash things out in a tavern as to what they were going to say and what they were going to do. So uh, taverns have always been kind of a big part of, of American society, right? Getting alcohol, having alcohol was a part of ev almost every American's uh, lives for, well, as long as the colonies, the United States has existed. But of course, here by the 1820s and 1830s, because of the, the increasing population, uh, because of the new immigrants bringing in new forms of alcohol, uh, like beer, like uh, whiskey, right? Well, not that Americans didn't already drink those things, but just because they're becoming more prevalent, a lot of people saw this as kind of a threat to American morality, right? That we were be just becoming too dependent on alcohol, too many people drinking. We have to make a lot of these poor and immigrant people start behaving the right way, drink less, act more like normal Americans, right? Kind of this uh, forced assimilation, if you will. And again, there was this idea that uh, men coming home from a factory job didn't have a lot of money, so why are they stopping either to hire a prostitute for sex or to go to a tavern and buy beer when they should be taking that money home to their families, right? And of course, if men drink too much, they may become violent when they get home, tear the family apart. So there was a lot of reasons why uh, anti-drinking became the cause that a lot of uh, Northerners kind of kind of kind of turned to. And again, before I get kind of too much further here. Remind yourself, uh, this is stuff that's happening in the North, right? Uh, the anti-drinking movement really doesn't take off that much in the South. It is somewhat, but not everywhere, right? A lot of these uh, religious revivals, they are happening in the South, but not nearly as frequently as, as they are in the North. And because of that, this reform movement doesn't happen as much in the South as it does in the North, right? And of course, a lot of things like prostitution just aren't an issue you see in the South because there aren't a lot of cities, right? There's a handful of cities in the South, right? In New York alone, there's five or six cities that they are as big as everything the South has across eight states, right? So again, this is a, this is a Northern issue, right? These are Northern things that are happening here. 
that we have to kind of understand uh, and kind of kind of see that it's it's really just happening in one part of the country in this in, the, in this period, right? So, anyways, the temperance movement really starts taking off here, right, in these northern communities where they see these problems happening on a daily basis. And again, it's kind of this middle class, upper class uh, way of making immigrants and poor people uh, behave the way middle class and upper class Americans want to see them uh, behave, right? This is the way you act in public society. This is what you should be doing, right? These are the things you should be drinking if you're going to drink, right? So that message is starting to kind of be, be pushed out here. And it actually kind of works, right? By the 1830s, about a million and a half Americans uh, have, have joined a thing called the American Temperance Society. Uh, by the 1840s, they're close to 2 million people. By 1851, the American Temperance Society is so big, has so much clout, that it's actually able to convince the state of Maine to ban alcohol consumption completely in the state, or at least the sale of it in things like bars and saloons and taverns, right? Uh, you still may be able to make it on your own, but you're not supposed to sell it to other people, right? There's personal consumption. So they actually get the state of Maine to prohibit the sale of alcohol, right? Something that Americans will come back to again in the, in the 1910s and 1920s when another kind of reform, moral reform period takes hold, right? And they are able to do this by using very effective propaganda, if you will. And uh, two cartoons sum up what's happening here. We'll start with the one on the right, the one that's in color. There you see an American man, and he's being asked to make a choice, right? A good choice and a bad choice. And again, uh, colors uh, have very important symbolic meanings in a lot of these cartoons, right? So the one woman uh, that's on this man's left-hand side, she represents the good choice, the good moral choice, right? She's get, presenting him with a glass of water or some other liquid, non-alcoholic liquid. And, of course, the man's supposed to choose that option. Now, of course, he's being tempted by, by this kind of more corrupting influence represented by the woman in the darker dress, right? She's taking him to an alcoholic drink, wine or whiskey, something like that. Of course, the man looks kind of longingly at the alcohol, but there's something important happening if you look at his body language. And in the 19th century, they, they take in all of this stuff, right? Again, you don't have to read. You just look at what's happening here. This guy wants to drink the alcohol, but his body's moving towards the water, right? He's been convinced that he needs to make the right choice, that he, as tempting as it is to make the bad choice, he needs to make the right choice. And it also kind of connects to something else here, right? A lot of these reformers, uh, there is some politics here. I know I kind of said it's, it's uh, political reforms really aren't on their radar, but in some ways uh, they see uh, political reform as married into these other kind of social uh, issues that they're dealing with. Because a lot of these taverns and bars and saloons aren't just places where you go to drink. It's where they hold political rallies. It's where a lot of people vote in the 1820s and 30s, right? So uh, one of the things they're kind of hoping to do by shutting down a lot of these places, by getting Americans to drink less, is to get kind of that corrupting influence out of politics. Take politics out of the taverns, put it onto the streets where people can see it, where it's more out in the open, where we can kind of keep control of things better. So there is a political element to these things as well, although that may not be their, their primary focus uh, when they're doing these kind of moral reforms. It's more about making people better uh, people, like in the cartoon on the right-hand side. But regardless, it is incredibly powerful and it's incredibly successful. The American Temperance Society is getting a lot of Americans to agree to either not drink or they're actually getting states or counties to ban the sale or use of alcohol in their jurisdictions. So the, the, this society, right, these moral reformers are actually quite effective. And what's really, uh, to me, kind of amazing about this period is something else that happens. Uh, you may get involved in the anti-prostitution movement to start with, right? And then you say, okay, now that we've kind of got the brothels out of our neighborhood, uh, let's start working on the bars. And then you find yourself going from cause to cause to cause. And a perfect example of this is a guy by the name of Horace Mann. He is one of these people that's been inspired by this religious message, uh, this idea of moral free agency and make good choices, right? He starts out uh, in the anti-drinking movement, and now he's got on to another movement, right? Another way to improve society, to make it better. 
For Horace Mann, it's about getting more schooling available in the North, in places like where he lives, Boston, Massachusetts. He becomes an advocate after pushing for anti-drinking and anti-prostitution. He starts saying, hey, look, one of the ways we can make people good people is to make it possible for them to have a good education. Because if they have a good education, they'll know the good choices. They won't be tempted to make bad choices. They won't turn to crime because they'll have other options. For him, it was about equalizing the conditions of man. If everybody has an education, they'll make better choices. They'll have more economic opportunity. It will make our society better. For Horace Mann, it was a way to make society more harmonious, to get people to go along better. You can get rid of extreme poverty by giving people better jobs. If they have job skills, can read and write, they'll be able to do better, support themselves, and take away a lot of problems in society. So he starts advocating for what's known at the time as the common school movement. Today, we would call it public education. For Horace Mann, we just need to start opening public schools. And if you stop and think about it, uh, that's a big step, right? Now, the Puritans had done something like that in the New England region when they first settled there and created the colonies in the 17th century. And it still kind of existed, this public schooling, but it was located just in cities like Boston or Providence, Rhode Island, right? And they were very kind of limited, these schools, as to who could go there and just uh, when they operated and how many students they could have. Horace Mann's idea is to go much beyond this. He wants to tax people and start funding a large number of schools. And not like not like today's uh, K-12 educational system. He, he's not advocating for that. But he does want to see rural towns, smaller towns, have schools, right? Right now, they're kind of limited to bigger cities that can afford them or had access to more education, more teachers, that kind of stuff. But he's advocating for these things everywhere so that even people in rural areas can go get an education, read their Bible, be good people, make good choices, right? It all kind of uh, stems together from, the, from this message that he's getting from these religious meetings over and over again. So he starts pushing for these for the growth of this uh, you know, publicly funded school systems uh, in, in northern states like Massachusetts, where he's from. And of course, there's a lot of pushback from this, right? Uh, some people kind of see this, especially these immigrants, like some Germans and a lot of Irish, saw it as a way to force them to not go to religious schools that they supported, that they wanted to go to. They wanted to send their kids to schools run by Catholic priests. That's how they understood education to be best, right? The people like Horace Mann are saying, no, 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 you need to go to schools with everybody else because there they'll be uh, taught to be true Americans, right? You know, you'll, you'll be forced to assimilate again. And of course, some local groups say, hey, wait a minute, I don't want somebody in the state capital to tell me what we can and can't teach here in our county, right? So there are local people that are kind of... Uh, resistant to kind of over being overseen by other groups. And of course, industry people, especially this, uh, you know, these capitalists, these factory owners really don't like the ideas of what these schools mean, because then really cheap labor, young kids that they're using in their factories won't be available, they'll be going to school, and they won't need their jobs that they have at these really low pays. So, of course, a lot of people push back against this. People like Horace Mann, these reformers that want to bring about publicly funded education, uh, they uh, have a hard road here to, to kind of go down, to force this change on. But by the 1840s, 1850s, virtually every northern state now has some form of public schooling that if you actually wanted to send your kids to school, you could in almost any northern city. Now, true, there's a lot of rural areas in the north where this still isn't possible. But for the most part, education now becomes available in the north for almost everybody. And again, to kind of contrast things, it's not happening in the south. And so you have to kind of ask yourself, why doesn't this movement catch on in the South, right? This doesn't seem to have a, a, a downside to it, right? Getting people to, 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 to learn to read and write and make good choices and make more money. What's wrong with that? Well, if you're a Southern planter like Jefferson Davis, uh, if the poor farmers around you go to, go to school, right, send their kids to school, then you lose power. Those kids might try to compete against your kids, right? So you don't like that idea. And then, of course, is another fear that if poor white kids learn to read and write, they'll take some of that 
and maybe pass it on to enslaved people or even free blacks. It, remember from our earlier lectures, it's actually against the law to teach any black person in the South in places like Alabama to read or write. So southern states are very slow to adopt this. They're, they see it as a, as a possible tool for slave rebellions. Uh, they see it as a challenge to the dominant planner class, uh, keeping that dominance, keeping control of politics in the south. Uh, so for the most part, uh, the southern states really resist this. They say it's, you know, again, kind of using some of the arguments that people in the north are, that, that you know, individual counties, uh, towns should be able to decide for themselves if they want public education. But it's really about the, the master class, these big giant planters uh, being able to hold on power. It's just they don't want the competition, right? And even some poor whites see it as kind of dangerous because if African Americans get an education, then it'll make it harder for them to compete against African Americans. So there's a lot of resistance in the South, and it won't be until after the Civil War, fully 30, 40 years after Northerners are doing it, that public education comes to the South, right? So there, there are some fundamental changes uh, happening in the North that just aren't happening in the South, and this is one of them, as you can see in a very concrete way. So now let's turn our attention to the one of the big reform movements that's obviously going to have a, a big impact on the country, and of course, that's the abolition movement, okay? So again, abolition is about removing slavery from the nation. And honestly, uh, that wasn't a new message, right? Uh, from, the, from the beginning of the colonies, even in the early uh, 1600s, like when Rhode Island was founded in 1636, uh, they were talking about getting rid of slavery. They made it illegal to have slaves in the colony of Rhode Island by the 1650s, 1660s. Uh, but you could still sail ships and bring slaves to the colonies, right? So even then, uh, there, was a, there was kind of a, a limit to just how far the anti-slavery movement worked. But by the 1790s in the United States, there was an, an American anti-slavery society, right, founded by Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It, it sought to end slavery in the country. But this older generation of abolition is different than what comes here in the 1820s and 30s, inspired by these moral reform movements. And the difference, quite simply, is timing. People like Benjamin Franklin, uh, Puritans like Roger Williams in the 17th century, right? Uh, they were what we would kind of call gradual emancipationists, right, or gradual abolitionists. They felt that you should get rid of uh, slavery slowly, incrementally. Get rid of it in your community, then get rid of it in your state, then get rid of it in the nation, right? How do you do that? By slowly giving freedom to slaves. So they would say the state of Pennsylvania is a perfect example. It does this in the, in the 17 uh, or in the in the 18. In the 1820s, uh, slavery is officially abolished in Pennsylvania, but there's still a number of people that are enslaved in Philadelphia until 1850. How? Uh, because they give freedom to slaves based on their age. When a slave hits the age, I believe, of in, in, Philadelphia, in uh, Pennsylvania, it was the age of 50, you were then no longer enslaved. You were emancipated. That's gradual emancipation. They also said that children of slaves would no longer be enslaved. So that was kind of a more immediate emancipation. But for a long time, there was a generation of slaves that lived in a, in a non-slave state that were still owned by other people. Well, here in the 1820s and 1830s, a new form of, of abolition emerges. Uh, people like this guy in the picture in the center bottom of the screen, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, they're a new generation of emancipationists, of abolitionists. And they have a very simple message. Slavery is bad and it needs to be gone. Not tomorrow, not 30 years from now, but today. Uh, if it's bad enough for you to want to get rid of slavery, William Lloyd Garrison would argue, you should get rid of it today. And again, that fits in well with this moral message he's been told, right? Uh, he thinks uh, slavery is a bad thing. It's a corrupting influence. Therefore, it needs to go away. Not sort of down the road eventually when it's convenient, but right now today, regardless of how bad it, the cost is, it's just that awful. So here in 1831, this guy, William Lloyd Garrison, actually starts a newspaper in Boston, Massachusetts called The Liberator. And in this, this newspaper, he basically just talks over and over again about how bad slavery is, about all the awful things that slave owners do, and why slavery needs to be gone. 
right? He is a very focused message here, all right? Slavery is bad. And he's starting to kind of catch on to, uh, this message is starting to catch on to a lot of people. As they're saying, hey, uh, alcoholism's bad, prostitution's bad, right? Uh, having uh, you know, these uh, competing uh, foreign kind of ideals in our country are bad. Let's fix all these things. Well, this message kind of catches on too, that owning other human beings is not right, that you shouldn't do it. So by 1832, William Lloyd Garrison has helped create a thing called the New England Anti-Slavery Society based there in Boston, Massachusetts. And it starts catching on across New England, right? And by eight, late 1832, it's not just like the Boston Anti-Slavery Society, it's now the New England Anti-Slavery Society. More and more people keep joining. Eventually, even in Western states like uh, Indiana and Ohio, they're getting memberships, uh, societies in their in communities there in those states is popping up. So they have to rebrand themselves again to the American Anti-Slavery Society. This movement is spreading. But I want you to notice something here. By 1840, there are over 2,000 local societies. Well, we, we would call them today chapters, right? Different local groups for this big society but they only have about 200,000 members. Think about what we talked about about the uh, anti-drinking movement just a few minutes ago. In 1840, there are 2 million members to the anti-drinking movement. So this thing is tiny by comparison, right? The a local society for the anti-slavery uh, society might have 10 members in your community, whereas the local anti-drinking movement, the temperance society, might have 100 members, right? So that's the one that's really dominating the airwaves here is the anti-drinking movement. That's the one a lot of Americans are really kind of identifying and working with. So if you're William Lloyd Garrison, you need to get people's attention. You need to get people to listen to you and start kind of uh, paying attention to, to your message. And he very much couches what he's talking about, not in economic terms, right? That this is good for us to get rid of slavery because it'll make us wealthier. He says it doesn't matter if it makes us wealthier or poorer. This is a religious moral argument. Again, he kind of uses those ideas of making good moral choices to, to, to answer what we should do with the issue of slavery. To William Lloyd Garrison, it's just obvious. Uh, slavery is a bad thing. In 1837, in his newspaper, he prints a thing called the Moral Map of the United States. And there he tries to point out again in these stark terms, using colors to kind of remind people what's going on here. The northern states that are getting rid of or have already abolished slavery, uh, they're the good states, right? They've made the good moral choice. What? Who hasn't? Southern states, places like Virginia, places like Tennessee and Mississippi, uh, they're using slavery. And then he tries to point something else out. If you look at this map carefully on the, lo on the left side of the map, that black, that, that, that moral corruption that he's pointing out to his viewers, his readers, right? He's trying to show them something, that this is spreading. It's going to spread. It's a bad thing that needs to end because it will keep spreading and it will keep tainting the country and it will make the country immoral. It'll damage this reputation, this idea that we are a special place in the world. So, so Garrison uses very stark terms to kind of make his points. He really tells uh, his, his readers, look, you have to care about this. You have to pay attention to this. You have to do something. If you don't, this problem is going to get worse and it'll just tear the country apart. So in some ways, he kind of sees what's happening, right? But he's also the one that's kind of making it happen, if you will. And he does it with some of the things he says in his newspapers. In the same edition where he says, you know, that he points out this moral map of the United States, how, how slavery is expanding and causing a bigger problem, not a smaller problem here by the 1830s, he also says something else. In one of his articles, he says that Southern slaveholders are, and he says this just straight up, the most evil beast God has ever created. He is not pulling any punches here. He is using a very radical message, saying over and over again, slavery is bad, people that own slaves are bad, and it all just needs to go away. Not tomorrow, not 30 years from now, today, right? He's for immediate emancipation and immediate abolition of slavery. He doesn't believe in that gradual approach that people like Benjamin Franklin or others uh, from that older generation would have endorsed, right? For Garrison, this is a problem that needs to be addressed now, right here, before it gets worse. 
And as we know, uh, that is not the message most Americans want to hear. Even today, uh, most Americans would prefer to ignore problems as long as possible. Well, that's not a new trait. That is something that's been around in our country for a long time. And Garrison and a lot of these early abolitionists in the 19th century are finding it hard to kind of convince people that this is a problem you have to care about, just like uh, drinking, just like prostitution, you have to care about this. Why? Because they don't see it that much, right? In places like New York, slavery has been abolished, right? Uh, if there are black, if there are African Americans on the street, they're free people, just like you are, right? Now, true, they're not going to be given the same uh, level of freedom, the same level of respect that a lot of uh, white Americans are, uh, but they're living next door to white Americans, right? They're not segregated in neighborhoods at that time. That's something that happens later on in, in the 20th century. So uh, for a lot of people in the North, they can kind of put this, uh, this issue on the back burner. These others, uh, the anti-prostitution, anti-drinking, those are much more front and center to them. They can see those things on their streets. So for people like Garrison, you've got to convince people that this is a problem that you have to pay attention. So they get out there and they keep organizing, right? They keep pushing their message. Uh, Garrison trains people to become newspaper people like him and then take those newspapers and spread it to other communities, right? Uh, other versions of the Liberator start popping up throughout the country. And they have a very simple message. In slavery today, all slaves, not some, not eventually, but right now, here today, it's a radical message. And the big thing that is kind of changed in this message, besides just the, the immediacy of it all, is the fact that no more should uh, slave owners be compensated. For people like Garrison and, and people like him, they think that, hey, uh, white Southerners that own slaves, uh, they've made enough. They've gotten enough out of this. Just the fact that they've owned another human being and used them for their own financial gain, uh, that's all they should ever get out of this. No compensation. Remember, they were talking about during the Constitutional Convention, maybe possibly we could end slavery eventually by compensating uh, people out, uh, slave owners with land out west as we expand the nation, right? Uh, g give up a slave, get a couple acres of land, whatever it might be. Maybe the federal government could just buy some of the slaves, right? There are all kinds of ideas being thrown around in the 1780s. Uh, but that's gone now. People like Garrison say, nope, no more. We just want this to go away. It's a moral issue. We don't care about the economics of it at all. So, of course, uh, Southerners hate this, right? They, they, they dislike this. Again, it's why abolition is never going to catch on in the South in any real way, right? Uh, but what's surprising here is it's also Northerners. They're also going to be frightened by this immediate emancipation, uh, or this immediate abolition uh, message that Garrison and others are putting out. So we have to kind of uh, look at that for a minute, right? Explain in part why this uh, abolition movement is taking so long to really kind of catch on in the North. And I do that by telling the story of this guy. His name is a Re Reverend Elijah Lovejoy. He is, an immediate, he is one of these radical abolitionists. And he has learned how to run a newspaper through William Lloyd Garrison. And he's decided... Reverend Lovejoy is going to go out west to places like uh, Dayton, Indiana, and he is going to go ahead and uh, take that abolition message out west, right? He's learned how to run a newspaper. Uh, he's learned how to uh, find these stories and try to capture people's attention. He's learned the arguments of, of radical abolitionism. And now he's going to move out to Indiana, one of those territories in the old Northwest territories uh, from, from the you know, post-revolutionary period that's never had slaves. And he's going to try and convince the people that live there in Indiana why they should become abolitionists. Not to get rid of slaves in their state. They've already done that. They've never had slavery in their state. But to do it throughout the nation, right? To do it in the South. So Reverend Lovejoy moves to a place called Alton, Indiana, which is uh, near uh, Gary, Indiana, I believe. And there in Alton, Indiana, 
Uh, Lovejoy comes to town. He's brought a printing press with him. He's a reverend. He's one of these guys preaching these messages. So he's actually very popular when he first gets to town. A lot of people are excited to see, uh, you know, somebody from back east come out. Uh, you know, he seems to seen as sophisticated, educated, of things that a lot of Westerners at the time don't have access to. So they're pretty thrilled that this guy has decided to come and live in their town and start a newspaper. But when they read his first edition of his newspaper, uh, they're upset. This guy is telling them that they need to care about ending slavery, that they need to become abolitionists, and they need to do it today, right right now. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't talk about it down the road. We need to do this, this, this thing now. Uh, they get so upset with his message. They see it as so controversial that they actually go to his little office that he set up and destroy his printing press so he can't make any more of these newspapers. Well, Lovejoy writes to his friends back east, gets them to raise money, send him a new printing press. He goes, prints another edition of his abolitionist newspaper. The crowds once again are upset. They come and destroy his newspaper press again. He once again asks his friends back east for money. They send him yet another uh, printing press. And the crowd this time comes and destroys the printing press and burns down the business with Lovejoy in it. They kill him. So what is wild here is Reverend Elijah Lovejoy is killed not by Southerners trying to keep slaves, but by Northerners who've never owned slaves. Uh, they kill him. Now, in truth, there are some Southerners because uh, this Alton, Indiana, is pretty close to Kentucky, right? So there are people coming across the Ohio River from Kentucky that are participating in this. They're the ones kind of saying, hey, this guy's kind of causing problems. But most of the people that actually do uh, the burning and destroying are right there from Indiana, right? They're not slave owners. So that has, to, that has to be answered, right? Why are Northerners so upset about this abolition message just as much as Southerners are? We understand why Southerners don't like it. It's, they see it as bad for them. So why do Northerners see it as bad for them? And the answer is, uh, it's the same thing that a lot of white Southerners that are poor that are never going to own slaves are afraid of ending slavery, the competition. Because what happens if you free, in 1837, more than a million African Americans? They're going to need jobs. They're going to need land. They're going to go everywhere they can to find those things. And this is while immigration is starting to ramp up in the North. So a lot of Northerners already feel like they're in intense competition for jobs, for land, for livelihood. And now people like Lovejoy are talking about adding even more competition. A lot of Northerners are afraid that they'll be overrun by former slaves coming up into their communities and making it harder for them to keep the standard of living that they want. So here in the 1830s, 1840s, you kind of see this abolitionist message that people like Lovejoy have. It's not resonating like the other reform messages, right? Uh, first of all, it's kind of remote. It's something that's in the South now. It's not really in the North. You don't see it in your, in your communities. But also, you kind of have this uh, vague awareness that uh, people like Lovejoy, like Garrison, uh, they're talking about something that could potentially be bad for you economically. And they don't seem to care about that. They don't seem to be invested in that, people like Garrison. They just want you to take the hit. And a lot of Americans are saying, I don't want to. It looks like this is bad for me. So that means that these abolitionists are going to have a pretty tough time of things. It kind of explains why this is so slow and why it takes so long to kind of convince Northerners to get to the get to the point where they're going to be willing to abolish slavery. But they keep at it, these, these, uh, these abolitionists. They keep pushing uh, f for this, uh, putting laws on the books to, to end slavery, to make it possible for escaped slaves to find freedom. They try to persuade as much as try to kind of use these moral arguments like Garrison. They keep putting on this message over and over again, no matter how dangerous it is, no matter how uh, they're, they're ridiculed and attacked in, in northern society, they keep pushing. And we also see something else kind of happening here, right? Again, kind of pointing something out. In this picture, you'll kind of notice who's front and center here. Uh, and now true, in the very front row, there's a guy that's speaking. But right behind him, there are a bunch of women. They're the ones that are actually putting on these anti-slavery uh, 
meetings, right? The, these abolition societies are actually run by these middle class women. You can see it actually from their uh, flyers that they put out. Like in the lower left hand corner here, there's a there's a reproduction of an anti-slavery uh, banner, right? A broadside that they would put up in the streets to announce, hey, in a few days, we're going to have a meeting here. This is where you want to go and meet us so we can talk about how to end slavery in the country. And then, oh, yeah, by the way, you can buy some uh, paintings, you can buy some purses, you can buy some clothing, right? Uh, so we know who's going to these things. It's women, right? For the most part, women are putting these things on and they're attracting other women to these movements by kind of appealing to their uh, consumer interests, right? Trying to say, hey, not only can you come and listen to a good message, uh, but you can also do some important shopping while you're here, right? A way to get them involved in things, right? So, so there's a there's a, a big movement here, right? Uh, and, and the same people are kind of running these things over and over and over again. So they're getting good at it. So they're not going to give up anytime soon, right? That's the one thing to kind of understand. And also, there's another point that's going to kind of emerge here pretty quickly. If you're a woman trying to kind of uh, get abolition done in this country, you're starting to realize something. You can't count on men to get this done. They're not here helping you run these things. They're not here usually uh, doing the hard, the heavy lifting to make these things happen. Uh, it's you. But when it comes time to actually pass a law to protect an escaped slave, uh, to, to make sure that slavery is illegal in your community, uh, you can't do a lot about it. You have to rely on men to do that voting. So you can kind of see how, again, one reform movement is going to lead to another, lead to another here. But to kind of uh, sum up this portion a little bit, right, uh, think about what one of these uh, religious advocates, his name's Theodore Weld, he's going to be a, a big voice in the abolition movement in the 1840s and 50s, but he's also kind of uh, one of these religious messengers, right, and he's kind of brought all of this together here in the anti-slavery movement, these religious messages uh, that you've been hit with for 20 years now since the 1820s. Uh, he's, he's found a way to kind of put this all together and make this very easy for people to understand. Weld said at one point in one of his kind of sermons on this, right, that no condition of birth, no shade of color, no mere misfortune of circumstances can annul the birthright charter which God has bequeathed to every being upon whom he has stamped his own image. So he's saying, look, it doesn't matter uh, if you're born poor or rich, it doesn't matter what color your skin is, it uh, doesn't matter uh, what happens to you, right? If, if you're born with uh, you know, a deformity, if, if, you, if you're born without sight, hearing, whatever, it doesn't matter what issues you have in your life, uh, we're all the same, right? God has made us all the same, even with all these differences. In the end, we're all people. And he says, look, we're all free moral agents. We all have to make good choices. We all have to be good people. So again, that message that Finney was talking about in kind of these religious terms has now been incorporated into this abolition message, right? And then Weld goes on to say this, he who robs his fellow man of this tramples upon right, subverts justice, outrages humanity, and sacrilegiously assumes the prerogative of God. What he's saying here is if you own another human being, you keep them from being the good person that they need to be, and you're keeping yourself from being a good person. You're playing at God. You're going against God's wishes. So for Theodore Weld, abolition is a religious message, right? And again, it has nothing to do with the economics of the situation. He could care less if it means that clothing prices will go up or down, right? He doesn't care. He just sees this as a bad thing that needs to go away, not down the road, but immediately. And that brings us to one other person that's kind of uh, invested in this, right, in a very real way. And that, of course, is Frederick Douglass. He is one of the major African-American um, anti-slavery advocates at the time, right? He is the leading black abolitionist in this country. Uh, gets his uh, freedom in the 1820s, 1830s, right? By the 1850s, he's become a big voice in the abolition movement in the North. And in 1852, he's asked to come to a uh, 4th of July celebration in, uh, in uh, Ohio. And on the 4th of July, that was a very kind of a solemn occasion. So they didn't have a lot of parties back then in, in a lot of places in the 1830s and 40s and 50s. So it was usually like on uh, July 5th or 6th that they would actually have kind of a celebration. So in uh, July 5th of 1852, 
Frederick Douglass gets up in front of a group of people in a state where that has never had slavery, right? That is never allowed slavery in its borders, right? And he gives a speech to a white audience that is nominally interested in abolition. And he says to them something kind of surprising. It's a very famous speech. It's one of our documents for this class, right? So I definitely uh, say you should go and read that, right? Especially for the paper on uh, Frederick Douglass that we do, right? But Douglass says, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. So that's how Frederick Douglass starts this uh, speech to an audience of sympathetic white people in Ohio, is by calling them something. So what is he, what is he saying, right? Is he saying, hey, you're cruel and heartless people? Is he saying you're motivated by greed? Are they hypocrites? Or are they being the moral compass of the nation? And I think it's pretty easy to see. He says, look, you people that say you're abolitionists like me, uh, you're hypocrites. Americans in general, are hypocrites, right? You say one thing, but you do another, right? He goes on to really say it in very plain terms. To him, the American slave, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sound of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your shout of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. So Frederick Douglass is trying to tell white Northerners, look, uh, you talk about uh, freedom and liberty, but then you allow millions of people to be owned and treated worse than animals. Uh, you talk about you know, uh, how, how important all of these things are, uh, how, how you want to be good, righteous, moral people. You want to be a righteous, moral nation. And yet you do things that are horrific that other people parts in other parts of the world would consider to be just horrific things. So he's trying to point out that Americans in general are being hypocritic, hypocrites when they're celebrating the 4th of July, but yet they allow other people to be owned. He's telling them, look, you can't ignore this problem. You have to do something about it. He's telling white northerners, you're not doing enough yet. You need to get to this. The longer we wait, the worse it's going to get. And he actually kind of closes out this speech by saying, look, eventually this nation's going to tear itself apart. And we'll deserve it because God will strike us down for not doing the moral thing, right? Not doing the right thing here. So again, this message is hitting you constantly, right? Think about it. The, the anti-slavery movement starts in this immediate, immediate emancipation idea in the 1820s and 30s. Here it is, 1850s. And Frederick Douglass is still telling white Northerners, hey, you need to get on the program here. You need to get with this. We need to do something about this. The problem's getting worse, not better. So again, it kind of tells you just how slow this movement is to, to kind of build up speed and, and really start to kind of get people's attention in the North, that they, they can really kind of find ways to kind of avoid this at best as possible, right? So, so a lot's happening here. And then there's something else that we're going to talk about next, right? And one of these uh, reformers, right, one of these women that's helping run a lot of these things, she's been a part of the anti-slavery movement for decades now. Uh, her name's Abigail Kelly. Uh, she marries a minister that's in involved in a lot of these uh, me religious messagings of, of the Great Awakening. And, and uh, she's been, he, he and she and her husband have been involved in these uh, reform movements, and they've kind of gravitated to the issue of abolition, right? So they've been going around like Elijah Lovejoy and William Lloyd Garrison. She actually worked for Garrison for several years, learning how to kind of uh, define these arguments and how to, how to uh, get people to pay attention to what they're saying, right? So she and her husband have been going around giving lectures on anti-slavery, or emancipation, abolition, call it what you will. And she and her husband have been attacked by people, right, uh, run out of town, attacked by, like Elijah Lovejoy was attacked, but not killed, obviously. 
But she said that something kind of happened as she was working here, trying to get people's attention, trying to get people to change their mind over abolition, right? And she said that, hey, look, you know, uh, here I am fighting for the freedom of other people. And then I realized we were manacled ourselves. And what she means here is that women were starting to realize that a lot of the same issues that African-Americans had that were enslaved in the South were kind of issues in, in a very different way that women had in kind of the, the domestic side of, of America, right? Uh, that women didn't have a voice, that they didn't have any real power. And yet they were the ones doing a lot of the work trying to fix these problems in American society. So in a very real way, yet again, one uh, reform movement kind of gave birth to another. And that, of course, is the women's movement, right? So here in the 1830s, 1840s, as more and more women are taking on these moral reforms, trying to make the country a better place, they start realizing that the only way that's really going to happen is if they themselves have real power. So as women become part of all of this, right, as they're, they're the ones that are kind of organizing these things, making uh, these arguments over and over to the public, a lot of women start saying, let's do something about this, right? Let's get real power so we can actually bring about this change we want to bring, right? And you kind of see how easy it is to kind of morph from one of these reform movements to another here, right? Sort of like Horace Mann starts in the anti-drinking movement and then becomes an advocate for free public education, right? Uh, two women that are going to be very important to kind of the groundswell of a lot of this, right, are Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. Uh, in the 1840s, they're young women involved in this anti-slavery movement. Uh, they're, 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 they want to become good at this. Uh, they've learned a lot. And in 1840, they decide, hey, we're going to go to England where they're holding the largest anti-slavery uh, convention in the, in the world, right, in London, England. And we're going to learn how to be better at this, how to organize better, get some new arguments, learn new ways, get better connections with more people out there so we can spread our movement even bigger. So in 1840, they go to Great Britain, they go to London to attend this, uh, this, this meeting, right, the, the, this convention, if you will. And when they get there, these two women that have been organizing events in the United States that are the leaders in their anti-slavery societies back home in New York find uh, that they're not allowed to attend simply because they're women. And that's ironic, isn't it? The women that are actually running these things, doing a lot of the work, can't attend a convention to learn how to do the work better. And it convinces them, these two women, that, hey, look, that, that there's more than one issue here, that the only way they're actually going to end slavery is if they themselves have political power. Because that's really the answer, right? They need to pass laws. They need to convince politicians to get rid of this. And the only way they're going to be able to get their voices heard is if they have political power. So in 1848, they organize yet another reform movement, this one based on women's rights. The first women's rights convention in the world is held in Seneca Falls, New York, uh, in upstate New York, where all these religious revivals are taking place. And there, they're going to call together about 70 people, all told, men and women together at this convention to start saying, look, if we're talking about freedom, if we're talking about good uh, equality for all people, then it needs to be all, including women. Uh, Angelina Grimke and Sarah Grimke are two other sisters, or two sisters that are there uh, bringing this message on. And here at this, uh, this uh, convention in Seneca Falls, uh, they decide we need to put out something that really kind of uh, explains what this is all about, what we women here are arguing and what we want to see come out of all of this, right, out of this movement for women's rights. And they come up with it very easily, right? Uh, they put together a document, it doesn't take them a whole lot, a lot of time, actually, called the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions. Uh, and you can kind of see it as they put out their, their, uh, their flyers, right? There are a lot of women involved in this, a lot of important women that are a part of the uh, all these different reform movements, they're showing up to this thing as well. They understand that a lot of these reform movements are actually interconnected. And again, there's a lot of men here, including this guy, Frederick Douglass. He's one of the participants of this thing as well. Because Frederick Douglass understands that kind of for one person to truly be free, all people have to be free. Because if women aren't going to be free, if they're not going to have the same rights as all men, then what that means is you can take rights away from some people that you could give them and take them away. So here in 1848, women say, look, for, for 
our nation to have true equality, for our nation to have true freedom, it has to be for everybody. And they can think of no better way of explaining this in their Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions than to use something all Americans are familiar with. They use the Declaration of Independence. They use Jefferson's words that announced that this, this country was now a new country, a different country than the empire it had been a part of, to say, look, Women are a part of our society. Women deserve the same rights as everybody else. And that's what they, they do, right? They, they, they say we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They're saying, look, when, to them, the words all men meant all mankind, all people were the same regardless of race, regardless of sex, gender, right? So this is a, a big movement here, right? A big moment, if you will. Uh, the, uh, the women's rights movement is, is a kind of a um, successor to all these other reform movements. Women are saying, look, to be f truly free, it has to be everybody. And yet there are still some issues here. One woman in particular, by the name of Sojourner Truth, a former slave that escaped uh, to the North, uh, she comes to a women's rights uh, convention in 1851 in Akron, Ohio, and there she has a speech. And again, this video is online, so I really do uh, suggest you go listen uh, listen to it, right? Watch this video. It's a powerful performance by the actress Alfreda Woodward, who does a rendition of Sojourner Truth's speech. But in this speech, uh, Sojourner Truth kind of looks at this white audience who actually booed her when she went on stage, called her all kinds of names. Uh, she goes ahead and gives her speech, and she says over and over again, ain't I a woman, right? And she's trying to point something out here. As a woman, as a, as a, as a woman slave, she was... She was expected to work just as hard as the men. She had to do a lot of the same jobs as the men, but yet she was still treated differently. Uh, she, could, she could be raped by the men, that, the enslaved men that lived with her. Uh, she'd be raped by the white overseers or the white owner, right? Uh, she, her children were used as tools against her, right? If she fought back, if she didn't behave, they'd threaten to take her children and sell them away from her, right? So she tried to point out that women, especially black women, both in the North and the South, were very much, were treated very differently by everybody else. And she was trying to remind everybody, look, if you're going to be talking about freedom, it has to be freedom for everybody, regardless of how rich they are, poor they are, smart they are, dumb they are. Everybody has to be treated the same, because if you're not going to treat everybody the same, then there is no true equality. Uh, that's really kind of the message of, of, of her speech, what she's trying to tell people, right? Uh, you can't treat people differently. You have to treat people the same. Because in the end, they actually are being treated the same. Enslaved people are being treated horribly. But she mentions that, look, some of us are being left out. And what's truly ironic here is that in, in the North, white women are leaving black women out of things. Black women are having to try and force their way into these groups, trying to force their way into these discussions. Because when they meet in, um, in uh, Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, there, can be, there are black men in attendance like Frederick Douglass, but there are very few black women. They're, they're just not allowed. So again, we kind of see, just like in the anti-prostitution, a lot of these reform movements have blind spots, if you will, right? Uh, white women have to be reminded that black women have some unique problems here and need some help, right? That they need to be a part of this or else it's not going to really happen. There is not going to be true equality for everybody. And also working class women are being left out a lot of this, right? Their needs aren't being addressed. Why are they forced to turn to prostitution? Because women are paid so little compared to men. That is not something that these other upper class and middle class women reformers are really talking about. They're talking about political reform. They're talking about political voices, which is great, but they're not talking about making sure women get equal pay, right? So, so that's kind of the, the, the first stages of all of this, right? But these are major points that are being made. And there are going to be some payoffs here. Uh, women colleges start popping up around the country. Women are start going to start getting access to higher education and to professional positions like 
becoming doctors. It's in the 1860s and 70s that the first real uh, professional women doctors, accredited doctors, start to emerge in the professional scene. Uh, female lawyers start to emerge, right? So those things are starting to happen here in the 1850s and 60s as education becomes more pronounced in the North, as the idea of women having political rights and political and economic options starts to kind of grow in the North. Uh, but there are still these blind spots, right? Again, a lot of black women, both uh, 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 poor and rich are being kind of uh, ignored in all of this. They're kind of being marginalized, pushed to the edges. So, so there are some issues that need to kind of be addressed here. So kind of in conclusion to this, right, to this whole kind of uh, two lectures on, on, on the North here in the 1800s before the Civil War, uh, kind of keep in mind uh, that the, these issues of, of a changing North, industrialization, urbanization, immigration, right, have, have caused a, a massive response on the part of a lot of Northerners. Inspired by this relig religious message of the Second Great Awakening, a lot of white Northerners are saying, hey, look, we got to fix ourselves. We have to make our nation a better nation. And at first they look inward, right, in their own communities, things like anti-drinking, anti-prostitution. But eventually they start kind of seeing things like slavery as another one of these causes, things that need to be taken care of. So uh, Northerners are starting to expand their view here in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, they're, they're still not firmly on board with abolition, but that's a growing movement. If you're a white Southerner, especially ones that own slaves, you're starting to hear more and more about uh, the abolition movement. There are more and more people joining it, right? And then, of course, it starts to spread, right? This idea that, that freedom should be for everybody starts to spread. The ideas of the American Revolution, all men are created equal, are still being defined here 70, 80 years after the Declaration of Independence. People are still using those words to say, hey, wait a minute. I should be included in this. I should have a voice here. I should have some of these freedoms that we're talking about. It could be men like Frederick Douglass. It could be women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, right? Uh, Abigail Kelly, the Sojourner Truth. There are a lot of people saying, hey, wait a minute, you need to include me. Those are all things that have to be kind of uh, answered here as we go, kind of go along, okay? So we'll kind of pick up with these stories as, as we, as we uh, uh, go forward here. The next kind of uh, topic we're going to turn our attention to is kind of the, the, the political world of the 1830s and 40s. Uh, we've talked a lot about that during the Jackson administration, but now we're going to kind of look at it in a different context, and that is literally this other meaning of manifest destiny, of not only being a great nation, a moral nation, but just being a bigger, more powerful nation. That is another part, another meaning of manifest destiny that emerges here at the same time all of this stuff that I've just mentioned has been going on, right? So we'll pick it up from there next time. Thank you very much.